Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Building Thinkers podcast. I'm thrilled to share today's conversation with Melissa Pickering. Melissa and I explored one of my 12 favorite problems, how might we create order out of chaos? And I knew I picked the right question for our conversation when Melissa noted in our podcast prep, this is literally what I love doing, untangling the most crazy challenges, breaking them down into solvable parts. Melissa has an incredible track record in product ownership, development, and leadership. From launching her own ed tech startup, I Create to Educate, which was focused on engaging more kids in STEM, to solving tricky challenges at Lego, where she got to think about merging digital and physical experiences, to making a powerful impact at the mom-focused product company Willow, and now leading product development as a senior director of product at Bose. Melissa brings order and innovation to every product and team she touches. In our conversation, Melissa shares both the people and product sides of creating order and the creative tension between structure and flexibility, especially in innovation and product development. We discuss the urgent need for focus in a world of constant distractions and multitasking. We also talked about when to make quick decisions and reach consensus with the team and when it's wise to slow down and avoid rushing into forced consensus, allowing innovation or improvement to emerge from a deeper look at options and opportunities. Whether you're in the product development space, lead teams, or mostly lead yourself, I think you'll find Melissa's expertise, insights, and leadership lessons incredibly valuable. Without any further ado, here's my conversation with Melissa Pickering. Welcome to the Building Thinkers podcast today. I'm so excited to be joined by Melissa Pickering. Melissa, this is so fun. I'm excited that we are reconnecting. What is our backstory? Like, how did we get to know each other, any of your recollection, and I'll fill in the details of what I remember. Yeah, I know. I was trying to remember, uh, I think we met at an ed tech social event of, of some sort in, in Austin back when we were both in respective ed tech spaces. That's what, that's what I remember, and over 10 years ago, for sure. Yeah, for sure. And I think I couldn't remember this part of, were you in ed tech women with us when I was helping with that? I think maybe that was the initial connection. I think so. Yeah, I think so. And then Greg connected us, Greg Garner, shout out um, yes. for him. Yes. And shout we were both Greg. in the midst of the ed tech world. You helped me navigate my first ed tech startup job greatly. So I very much appreciate that. That time there was quite a few, there was quite a bit of energy around ed tech in the startup space. I think it was hot or booming, quite a bit of interest. Yes, and everything was free. Nobody was charging yet, which made things really complicated. Nope. Okay, Melissa, I'd love for you to tell our listeners a little bit of your backstory. What is it that you build? What is it that brought you to the work that you're doing today? Any of that? Yes, so I like to say, so I've been in product development. I build uh, products, but also like to say I build teams. And I started out literally building as an engineer and with roller coasters and that, that led me on a journey to then continue to inspire other kids and particularly women to want to build things. And that's what led me into the ed tech space. I had an ed tech startup for a few years and then after I sold that, I had an opportunity to go live as an expat in, in Denmark and so build teams and Lego products, which most folks are familiar with. And then I had a foray into m building products for moms for a couple of years and most recently now build products for folks to enjoy music and sound. And that's, that's at Bose. That's incredible. And I think just over, as you think about the course of your work, the topic that I'd love to get into. So in the podcast, we explore my 12 favorite problems. And the one that stood out to me for the work that you do is how might we bring impactful order out of chaos? <laughs> and it's a big systems question, but I think maybe we could start with maybe any stories from your early career that sh maybe shaped your approach to creating order from chaos. What is it that you think of when you think about building and creating order where there is not order? Anywhere you want to get with that. Okay. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that is probably the most motivating in terms of, of my job. And, and that can be order in from a people perspective, as well as order from a even product perspective. The I'll start with a story actually from my time in Lego 
there's, and I think it, the large companies at that time and even continuing to be, there's, there's a challenge around digital transformation and, and how to evolve the, a very stable brand and company to yeah, be more relevant with, with the world. And so that tends to create a little bit of chaos, particularly when you have a organization that's really been successful from an orderly process and development. And if you think of the product like Lego itself, it's very systematic and that's essentially how the organization works as well. And so then to then to be forced, an organization and to be forced into this change of kids are playing differently. We need to think about how to go to market differently. But there's all these things related to digital transformation that just creates this sense of chaos where my little piece in that was building out a team to to think about new products that would blend digital and physical worlds that would be relevant for kids. But that was just one piece of a lot of different things changing within the organization. That's one story, I think, particularly on a larger scale level that that attracted me to um, yeah, order, bringing order out of chaos. And now there's a similar journey I'm on my role now in Bose. And you could say even in my startup, I've worked in a couple of startups of my own and the other for mom products that that is by design, startups are chaotic. And you could say it's a different type of bringing order to chaos where maybe there's just always chaos. Yeah. Maybe we can go deeper into the two sides that you talked about of like product order and people order. So in the case of somebody that's maybe starting off on the people side and they're building a new team, how do you like to think about what's your own mental frame or framework for working with a team and bringing structure maybe when you're coming into a new role? Yep, that's that's a good question. So I to figure out people's and this may sound a bit cliche, but their strengths and then there's a bit of both that as well as where they get energy and and actually having an open conversation uh, with them about that. So saying, okay, this is my perception that it seems like you really get energized by this and and this is also an area you're you're good at and then to make sure that's open in in the the space and then finding there's usually enough to do in a team. I've had teams where they're supporting across different business units. I've had, like my team now, there's an entire business unit. So either way, there's usually enough things to do that then it's like a puzzle for me where then it's to map, right? The strength and energy of the person into, you could say like the job to be done that's often used in product world. So that's in coming in and assessing a team and figuring that out. The beauty of within a larger company is if there's that strength and energy fit there's not necessarily mapping to a role within the team there's opportunities and i actually spend energy and take seriously of okay are there other areas in the organization where i think that would be like a good fit and like being able to help put people put nav- navigate there so those are a couple ways of finding that puzzle of coming in with a new team the building a team from the ground up like in a startup since that is often a lot easier to do take the puzzle pieces from the, the starting point yes and then when you think about now on the product side and that's of course a theme in the roles that you've had in product development and leadership when you think about the world of product design and the types of work that you and your team get into where do you think about this same idea of going from chaos to order and yeah let's start there in that yep so it's funny because we were talking about this just a few colleagues yesterday in product development when you're up front in that upstream fuzzy phase where you have a customer need and you have an idea of like how a product could solve that need and you have a, a, a general idea of the business opportunity then it's finding all the ways that those converge. Mm. And it can be chaotic because there's not one sort of stake in the ground. So as you're prototyping and testing to understand like really what the customer finds value in, you're also figuring out the feasibility if the product can be built, as well as running the business case numbers and all of these things it's an iterative process and it has to be an iterative process to land at the right value proposition. I've seen experiences where folks, if you do, if you do it in parallel, you say, okay, we created this say amazing prototype and customers or kids or whatever, love it. And then, okay, now go build it. 
then there's oftentimes a mismatch of if it can actually, right, what was actually sold in or validated as good value proposition could actually be built. And if you run these work streams in parallel, it can feel chaotic because you're iterating back and forth, but then the day always converging to then, you could say, order, where you say, okay, this is a product with this number of features that we need to achieve, and we know it's feasible, and we know we can hit this margin in profit. That's when it gets more orderly, but it usually is most successful when you've had the iterative yeah. chaos at the beginning. Mm. So I almost hear in that, that the chaos is necessary to get to order. Like it's a part of the process that is key. And it's almost like knowing that there will be that parallel track that you're talking about is its own form of structure within yeah. some flexibility. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, that's a good point. There are still some boundaries, but I think I've also seen with teams, if a team member isn't necessarily comfortable in that yeah. like iterative and it can feel very chaotic, yeah. right? It's just a natural part of the process. I've seen then sometimes teams want to converge too quickly uh. and because it just feels, feels uncomfortable where I've also seen on the other side where, and this often happens in R and D groups where you just spin and spin and spin and spin and never converge. And then that also is depending on the coal, but if you're trying to get products out to market, it's never ideal. Yeah. So maybe there's a pendulum of some sort or like a, yeah. a happy balance within the teams. I think this is also connected to the broader ideas of innovation in that like by nature, by definition, if you're doing something innovative or disruptive, like it hasn't been done before. So there isn't an exact right way to go about it. How do you all think about that? Like in the work that you're doing now, when you're thinking about innovation and new products that don't exist or modifications, is that again, like a frame of thinking or is it more broad and changing itself over time? Yeah, I think that in terms of thinking about new new products and, and innovation, there's a few starting points that we have, and particularly when we're thinking about the sound and, and music space, or how people experience sound, say, in the home or in the go. There's one of my favorite starting points, and this goes broader than this, but also just general consumer products, is understanding what are people doing for hacks now? Mm. What are the things they're doing that maybe you could find a product that would be made easier mm. of something that they already want. I think that's a really good signal and be like, okay, like they're hacking this experience together. That's a signal that they want yeah. those experience. So let's figure that out, how to make it easier. The other one is just, that's more like classic. Like where do we think how to be a little bit more predictive? Like where do we think trends are going from how people expect to, in this case, it would be experience sound in the future. So be like future casting type thinking to then to funnel back. But I think like one of my favorites is the yeah. hacks. I think we, again, in the, the startup where we built products for moms, this was like one of my favorites because yes okay i was thinking about the ways one, because i was a mom and the product that you were a part of the team did not exist when i was a mom needing said product and i had my own hack for said product <laughs> yeah yeah and mom, very clever and find ways to make lives easier and so that was always a great way to figure out where to develop products that people want yeah absolutely what is it when you think about this area of work, what is it that people overcomplicate within this topic? One of the sentences I like to use here is if only people knew. So when it comes to creating this order, building structure in innovative spaces, if only people knew, what comes to mind when you think about that across your work? Maybe one thing that comes to mind is trying to overprocess something that really just needs guardrails and a framework versus a strict process. That could be one way of overcomplicating, in, in my opinion. Another way of overcomplicating would be finding, taking, I guess you could say, like a tech first approach. So we have to have some crazy out there technology that has to be uh, innovative. When again, back to what are people hacking together? Are there like cool innovations that can be done with existing technology that's solving a, a user problem or making a behavior easier. 
And that maybe a third thing is I'll use an, a Lego example. Lego, I don't know if you're familiar, but now has, we have one on our wall. We, I have two a, boys um, that are nine and six. And so yeah. we are very so, familiar yeah, with the Lego, yeah. all the things. Yeah. All the things Lego. So now you can build picture frames. Right, so you have little pieces and you follow in, so you have picture frames of Lego scenes. And that is, it's a, it's a new product that's still using the same core product and system in play. It's just, it's just redone in a, a different way that then I think like that type of innovation, I call it like perceived innovation. So it's, it feels really new, but like at the end of the day, they're still just making pl like, very good plastic bricks that are colored, but still. <laughs> so I think like that's a, where it's like, when we think product innovation doesn't have to be, but you can also do things that are perceived innovation that people will still be inspired by and, and talk about. Yeah, I saw another layer of it when there was the integration in Lego with like an iPad and a QR code or in the different, I think it was with the Mario Brothers games. Yeah. How yeah. that connection. It's yeah. Yep. That's exactly those. My team worked on those. I thought maybe digital physical. <laughs> yeah, physical products and super, yeah, Lego Super Mario. Awesome. Definitely one of the popular. Yeah, ones. and I see that connection back to your startup, uh, back to iCreate, and the the lessons that maybe you brought from there and the experiences. And maybe that takes me to another question. It's not like on my list, but I just think about this a lot. Of like when people have different careers, like going to different companies and the things that you learn and take with you, how do you like to think about like the lessons that you bring from other fields or other products when you're coming into a new work culture? I imagine as you think about the Lego work culture and the other teams that you've been a part of, um, do you explicitly think about those things or do they just rise up as you're doing work? Yeah, no, I think definitely explicitly think about those things and trying to, in the most simplest way, read the room yeah. of the culture. I think different companies certainly have different pulses, you could say. I I would say that, even, so Bose, as well as the startup I was at before, cultures are very engineering, sort of innovation led, which then creates like a dynamic where it is, people are problem solving and inventing and creating, which it, it creates a whole dynamic. With my own startup, and you always learn as you go through your career, but the type of, what is the type of culture you wanna create yourself? And if I were to do a startup myself again, I think I would be inspired by being more intentional up front because once you have a culture established, it's really at the pulse of the company and then and it's difficult to change. Yeah, it almost takes on a, for better, a for life worse. of yeah. its own because that is kind of the nature of the culture is like people start doing things without even being asked because it is business as normal. It's part of the culture. And so whether that was in the direction that you hoped or not, to your point, like that shifting. And I think this is interesting, just a connection point that I have here is I'm doing a lot of learning experience design for companies and really living in that space. So I'm working with a lot of like Fortune 150 companies. And so I come in as like an external part of the team for a period of time, but I don't live in that culture. And so I have to do a lot of that reading the room quickly and as a part of the research. But I'm curious as you think across these companies that you've been a part of and you're thinking about what is something that you think is most needed at this moment in time? Maybe let's start with the culture side of things. What do you think people are struggling with right now as they're trying to figure out like how to be human and work together with digital tools that are expanding and like what strikes you as the biggest needs that people are wrestling with to get their work done well and continue to thrive as humans as they're doing it? Yep. Honestly, I think it's focus. I think with, with the pandemic that happened, we have become so accustomed to doing literally five things at once. I was thinking about this the other day, sitting in a meeting room and I was looking around and I was like, everyone has their computer open and their phone in, we're in a meeting room, physical meeting room. And that used to not be the case. Like we would be in a physical meeting room and you're there. You didn't also have your computer open like with Slack going too. And then of course, when you're virtually at, at home working, you probably have a couple of chat windows open plus your Zoom call that you may or may not be paying attention to plus a pet or kid or whatever over here. And I think that is, 
I think underlying, I think that's stressing everyone out because it's, and then how can we, and as I say this, my dog is, <laughs> yeah, but it's, and it's, I think we've lost that ability to like focus, not ability, but I think maybe discipline yeah, to focus. Yeah, the be, habit of focus. Yeah, 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 yeah. And be present because it's expected to you'll get side chats and a, a call or whatever it's, or it's, it's expected to be able to be on call even when everyone knows their meetings all day. And so mm -hmm. you can't possibly be split like in three different, um, yes. uh, yeah, mind spaces. So yeah, focus, I would say. This it's is focused. interesting. Cause this is an area I like to read on because I love, I think Greg might've started some of this, like the, he got me into a lot of those productivity books and I've been naturally driven yeah. by like always wanting to, I love learning. I love growing. I'm ambitious and unapologetically, and I'm interested in improvement and tweaking for myself and for helping others. But in this area of focus, like a couple things come to mind. One is Daniel Kellerman thinking fast and slow and yeah. the idea that you actually can't multitask. You're just switching mm -hmm. between tasks. And so that to your point, brings this pressure. I think the other thing that's interesting goes back to culture, like what is accepted and expected mm -hmm. of us in a culture. And I'm listening right now to Cal Newport's slow productivity. And he mm -hmm. talks about how, like what we measure, like what the heuristics are of productivity in a knowledge worker digital world are like Slack messages and emails. It's like this, perceived productivity that's not mm -hmm. real because you're actually, you could be much more productive by turning all of that off and doing one thing for a period of time. But it's almost like from the employee perspective, maybe don't think we have permission to do that because we think yeah. being seen on Slack means I'm working. Even if my response took very little actual thought or effort, and is taking me away from some sort of deeper work. A hundred percent or just, okay, I'll call into this call, but I'll stay off video so I can catch up on emails. So, <laughs> so what, <laughs> I even call into the call. <laughs> so I think it's, yeah. Yeah, from like a leadership perspective, what do you think are maybe some potential solutions there for the impact that you're looking for to shift? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. I think one thing is incur well, encouraging presence. And then I think in that same notion, it's like leading by example. Like I know I catch myself a lot of times when in a conversation and I'm like, I'm literally not present right now. Like I need to just close laptop, be present. And, and so that's something that I want to make sure as a leader that I'm doing mm -hmm. to then of course, set that expectation. And then I think acknowledging the time, the focus time that's needed, right? I think there's, a, there's again, this notion of meetings equal, kind of a like equal productivity. And there are, I've seen this done, we actually did this at Lego and it can work well if everyone does it. When you have blocks of time in a company, it's okay, no one can set meetings nine to 11 on Thursdays, because that's the focus time for designers. And that's when managers are supposed to be available to have ad hoc meetings. And in a large company, it, it doesn't work unless all, yeah, like all teams it. do it. Yeah. But when all teams do it, like it's actually, it's pretty amazing. So I think, again, that's something as a leader that I can talk to colleagues to figure out, like, are there things that we can do like that, that create that space to give permission to not feel like you have to attend a meeting or book a meeting? Yeah. I think one of the ways that in this book by Cal Newport, he was talking about how if somebody invites you to a meeting, but you're looking at your schedule and you really don't have time to do it, but there is this social pressure to say yes. And so he was unpacking why it feels like we're always so close to the edge. And if one extra thing got added to the plate, it would just all fall apart. But why we don't, why we don't actually fall apart all the time, nor do we say we have all this margin. It's right at the edge. And I was like, wow, that's really true. And he said, it's because of this, like when we get to the point where we're, I know next week I'm traveling for work. I can't take on any more meetings. If somebody asks me, like, I know I'll say no, but if it was one where I'm traveling like half day, I might be tempted to say yes. And then it's going to push me too close to the edge because 
there's still this like social pressure to say yes. Let's say it's a client. I think I need to say yes. Instead of saying, actually, to be more helpful to you as your consultant, I need to push this out a week. Does that work for your timeline? But there is this like noticing and naming. That's what's happening psychologically for us to release maybe some of that social anxiety <laughs> that comes with it to do what is best for both you and the team. I don't know, does that resonate? Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's, there's a lot of times I was talking to someone about this the other day. I said, we need to address this. And then they put a meeting on the calendar, but I'm, I'm like, but we don't need to address it now, next week. Or we get, it's just like at some point, right? So it's also, I think it's this notion of, okay, we just need to like do this now. I'm like, no, it's not necessarily now, but in being okay, we're not gonna do all the things all at once we can yeah. we can space out what needs to get done and and we'll probably be more productive that way yeah maybe that's part of the speed of modern time and that's why he named the book slow productivity because he says there's the slow food movement there's the slow city movement that tries to make it more accommodated for pedestrians and it's we're going back to the reality of we're human we're not a brain on a stick we have a body that needs to be cared for and not just like machines in meeting meeting for output and i think the place where it's really interesting to me is like what is actually more quote unquote productive and if it's not the frenzied like slack message check your email every six seconds or something like that and the loop which i find myself able to fall into just as easily of checking this in like a cycle instead of doing the deep work yeah so the, the, I was thinking about bringing full circle to what we were talking about at the beginning with the chaos and like the front end part of, of product development and innovation. We talk sometimes now where we talk about going fast or sorry, going slow to go fast. So taking that upfront iterative time that can, that while it feels chaotic, it's like, it's time that you have to take before defining yeah. the product. And it's okay. We want to, we need to block in this time because once we go these iterative cycles then which it may feel like going slow we're not just kicking off production or d development right away but we have higher if we take that g go slow to go fast later we'll have higher conviction that we made the decisions of the design and the features and the positioning and everything and then we can go fast later through through development if we've taken that time up front yeah that makes a lot of sense it's like the dominoes that fall once you start getting them in motion if you set them up correctly then it all flows from there and if you haven't taken that time you might get part way and one of the dominoes goes the wrong way and it all stops anyway and then yes. you have to come back to that production yeah okay there's something in the notes that i was wondering if you wanted to hit on and this is back in the over complication and you talked about how what is the crux of the problem what needs to be true to solve the problem? What are the assumptions? Is there anything else around that? Is that part of how you think about the product cycle? De yeah, definitely when we're thinking about defining the product or in the product development cycle, if there's a issue or a challenge and it's, I think a tendency for folks to, I, I like to say six-year-olds on playing soccer. And so I feel like everyone runs to the ball at once, right? So it's like everyone's, because everyone wants to help if there's like an issue. And then it's immediate solution mode. And then oftentimes I think then there's a tendency to figure it like, okay, what is the actual like problem and what are we like trying to solve for? Yeah. And the other thing is to what are our key assumptions and I hypothesis, like going back to like listing out what is our hypothesis and taking a more scientific approach where I think, again, he was, you tend to want to just jump into solution mode. And if we're not like a little bit systematic at how to approach a problem, then I've seen that you lose focus. And then if a solution doesn't work, it's hard to then go back to, okay, what were the key assumptions that, that maybe one of the assumptions wasn't true, mm -hmm. that I think is one of the, the good ways to guide that process. Mm -hmm. And I think that connects to a question around maybe walk us through something that you used to not know how to do and now you know how to do it going forward. Yep. So I, I maybe still struggle with this a little bit, but I used to not know how to be, you could say, patient enough to allow that some of the chaos that I was talking about converge, you could say, not only in a product development cycle, but also in when I think about change management and change within an organization and driving that change. 
I, I often can see, I'm like, oh, I can see all the, connect all the dots. I can see all the things that we need to change. And then I just want them all connected. I know how to, I know how to fix those. I just want to fix those. And there's a couple tactics to that. Again, judging from the culture of the organization, different tactics are, are useful at different times. One mechanism is to just bulldoze and, and change everything. I think there's another mechanism that I've learned um, to think about influence and that's how to influence um, stakeholders around then um, and that way I've seen then it does take longer but there's oftentimes more ownership of the change and which is of course like really important if you want a change to actually stick right within an organization. Yeah I think that's so powerful that difference between doing it getting it done kind of yourself no matter what versus influencing and bringing everybody with you especially back to the idea of the exponential power in the longer term plan of setting things up right. I see a connection here for the people side of it to say, there's only limited things we can do as an individual, but collectively there's that exponential power. And as a leader, part of our role is then influencing those that we're leading so they can be successful with whatever the objectives are of what we're after. Yeah. And as you think about, so that's an example of something that changed over time. When you think about your own like ongoing learning and growth, I think we're both learning nerds here. And so how do you think about growing as so many things? I think a lot of people are continuing to swirl in this area of what do I do with AI? Like how, to what extent do I need to know and integrate that into the work that I'm doing? And it depends on your field and all of that. How do you think about learning and growth yourself and your work? I think about the state of flow that is yeah very much... Uh, guiding learning, finding that right balance of being challenged for, and as well as like leaning on tools and experiences that I've had that I feel like I can use when I'm on either side of the line. And I think this is human nature, right? And this is, goes back to our ed, ed tech days that it can be anxiety provoking. For me, I get very anxious when I'm um, below the line and not feeling like I'm challenged um, enough. And that's how I'll be intentional when I find myself in that point to then, okay, this is like, why am I feeling anxious? It's okay, I'm not being challenged enough, so how do I, and there's usually a number of different ways to approach that. It's okay, is it the role that I can change and do I have an opportunity to then shape that or is it the, the space that I'm in? So depending on the situation, then I figure out like how to then move myself to a space where I, I can be challenged, but of course leverage tools that help one of the things that I talk, again, I push my team members when I can sense that maybe they that need to be pushed to a, a challenging space is I like to use, think about a, a Venn diagram of, okay, what is good for that person and what is good for the company and, or the team and making sure that there's, and making sure that there is an, an overlap. Um, and that's also a way that I've encouraged team members to think about new roles for themselves. And that goes back to what we were talking about before of leveraging their strengths and where they get energy. Yeah, it strikes so, me that um, like your career is a testament of that. Your recognition of when it was time to get the next challenge has allowed you to grow in each role and make such an impact across really diverse companies. Yep, that's absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, let's shift to any recommendations, any book recommendations, podcast input, and just anything else and where people can find you if they want to learn more about the work that you're doing. Yes, absolutely. A few books in, in different spaces. One that's related to what we were talking about is Switch by the the Heath Brothers. The Heath Brothers have a number of good books I like, and it's just really about change and how to inspire change within organizations. Another one that I have really appreciated from a leadership perspective is, I think it's called Powerful by, I think it's Patty McCord. And that is, she talks through a lot of, a lot of uh, leadership principles in some of the culture within Netflix that I've been inspired by. And then the third one gets into more in the product development space. And that's the power of moments, which is, I think, I really appreciate because it talks about how you can develop products that really evoke emotion in people. And that is, I think, a really nice way of thinking about product development. 
<laughs> Melissa, yeah, thank yeah. you so much for your time. I know there's so many things going on in your world and I really appreciate it. And it's been so fun to reconnect and just hear some lessons from your career journey so far and you're just getting started and continuing on. And so thank you for taking the time to share that with us. Thanks so much for listening to the Building Thinkers podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. And if you enjoyed what you heard, please leave a podcast rating and review. That helps more listeners find us in the world of podcasting algorithms. You can find out more about my learning and development strategy services at buildingthinkers.com. And remember, there's no limit to what you can learn.